All right. Um, so, so far we've had two talks by rocket scientists about rocket science. I'm a plumber, uh, and I'm going to be talking about infrastructure. Uh, and it used to be, you know, when you're a data guy, you'd have to apologize, but it's no longer true because everybody's talking about big data. Uh, and so when you go to parties and you're an infrastructure guy now, you're obviously a plumber. Uh, so I'll be telling you some information that you can use at parties uh, about big data infrastructure for when people are wanting to know. Uh, so the plan is to talk about the platform space. Basically, if you have data, particular big data, uh, and you want to figure out, like, where do I put it and how do I operate on it, um, there's a bunch of work that's been going on in computer science and sort of two different fields of computer science about doing that. And so I'll talk about that, kind of a brief history of platforms from a, a database perspective and what I'll call a distributed systems perspective. Uh, try to give you an idea of what the platforms are that are available. Uh, and then sort of with the time that is hopefully left, I'll give you a little bit of an advertisement for some work that we're doing, kind of trying to span those two worlds, what our approach is, uh, what features we have. And we've actually built a system. Uh, we spent about four years building it. Uh, and so if you have big data and you want to crunch your big data, uh, and this sounds like it might work for you, we'd be happy to talk to you. So I'll also be interested in uh, calling for customers who might have problems that they'd like to try uh, on this platform. So this is obviously the big data era. Um, some of the big data is coming from science. Some of the big data is coming from us uh, with our devices and things. There's been an unprecedented growth uh, in how much data there is and how much opportunity that might give us. Uh, and so obviously kind of on the so sort of the advertising and social network side, we have Twitter, we have you know, status updates and things. There's a ton of information that's being generated about how people are feeling, what they're doing, what they're thinking. Uh, it's out there. Um, if you look at some of the large sites that are doing things like you know, providing social network services, uh, some recent numbers from Facebook, they have over 1.3 billion uh, active users, on, if you measure them on did something a month kind of mode, and you know, lots of things being conveyed about what they like and what they don't like on a single daily basis. All this information is getting generated sort of every day. Uh, likewise, Twitter, there's all this noise being generated uh, about how people are feeling and what they're doing and, you know, I'm brushing my teeth or whatever. Um, lots of users want you to know that and they're tweeting. I think I have eight tweets total, so I'm not a, a Twitter user. Uh, but again, there's a lot of information which can be mined from that and applications for that. Um, everybody is sort of interested, maybe that's why you're here, uh, because you're interested in big data. You know, people are talking about it in the popular press as well as in technical uh, circles. Enterprises are trying to figure out how to use it to uh, decide if they're doing the right thing or how to get more customers. Web companies, online businesses, governments trying to figure out how people are feeling or how to help them uh, get the information they need. Public health researchers are trying to figure things out from tweets, social scientists, and so on. So there's just a lot of data that's out here and people are recognizing this untapped value uh, and a lot of opportunities to understand what's going on help optimize things that your business or your organization is trying to do, to try to assist people, get them the information they need after you figure out what they might need, uh, and or to sort of compete with your business. Uh, and so this is sort of driving this big data, the information is being created, let's see if we can do something with it. Um, so basically, you know, one of the reasons, sort of the cartoon of that says, we're all generating this information, it needs to go somewhere, what are the platforms that this can go into uh, to store that data, to process that data, and make sense of it. So there's actually two communities that have been looking at data. So one is the database community. So in 1970, a um, guy at IBM Research named Ted Codd wrote a paper about a new way of thinking about data called the relational model, and basically kicked off what became a revolution in data management and a huge multi-billion dollar business uh, that led to the systems that are pretty much you know, inside everything we have. Again, our devices are all running little databases. You know, all the e-commerce that you do is back to databases, all the information that uh, you know, is being sort of generated about you. A lot of that is in databases, living in this sort of in this world. And so, so the, the database world has been at this for a while. In around 2000, this web thing happened. And, you know, lo and behold, it caught on. Uh, and there was another community, uh, sort of the distributed systems community, that started to address the issues of how do we, you know, get the information on the web, you know, indexed and searchable. And so Google, you know, and Yahoo and companies were doing that. Amazon wanted to sort of reach out and sell lots of things. Um, Facebook providing social networks, they all started but needed to do something with their data. And their data doesn't look like the data that goes in relational databases. And so there was a need for a different kind of platform. Um, I'll, what I'll show you is what that platform started out looking like, how it's kind of coming down, ending in the same place or a similar place uh, to the database field, how these things related. Uh, and so we'll take a quick look at sort of those two different approaches to dealing with data. So in the database world, it's been a long time where data's been gathered, 
Uh, people have been building their businesses around data. Relational databases, again, came out in the 70s. Language called SQL, which many of you may use when you sort of manage your data, your small data today. Um, in the late 70s, data started getting big by late 70s standards. Uh, and so people were starting to look at how can I use a collection of computers rather than one computer to basically manage my data. A bunch of things were tried. And in the 1980s, there was a sort of a big breakthrough where people realized that you could use what's called um, you know, sort of partitioning or sharding in modern terminology, basically to sort of take your data and scatter it across many computers somewhat randomly in a way that I'll show you later, um, and, and then process that data in parallel on many machines. And techniques were developed for doing that for all the kinds of things that, that the language SQL needs to do. Um, and so there was a, one company that's a little bit south of here called Teradata. It's kind of the big gorilla in this space. Uh, and in the early 2000s, it became clear that we're getting more and more data, and there was a business opportunity here. And a lot of companies took another run at this problem, um, again, using kind of similar techniques. I put Data Allegro kind of in highlights there because they're a company that's only about 15 minutes from here, and they were sold for quarter of a billion dollars to Microsoft a couple of years ago. Um, so, so there's sort of like been local activity in that area. But lots and lots have been going on for many years kind of on the database side. The bottom line is the picture at the bottom, which is you have a cluster of computers. Each one has its own processing, its own cores, its own memory, its own disks. And they're harnessed basically to be sort of a single compute engine uh, to process big data. And this is something that's been, you know, there's a good history as to how to do this and what the good algorithms are. For building such things. Um, there's also kind of a flip side, which is where does the data come from? When you do something, you buy something, you take some action, a little what we call transaction happens that records that. And so there's also a need to do sort of real time transaction processing. That's another thing that those kinds of machines have been harnessed for. These are the apps that power our daily business and produce the data that needs to be warehoused and analyzed. Um, and as far back as, you know, about 30 plus years ago, um, Companies have built systems that do this, again, with these shared nothing. So that's kind of, it's old news, and it's always been about big data. In the database world, it's just that big has been changing as disk sizes have been you know, getting smaller and more dense, and then there's been getting bigger. In the systems world, the late 90s brought us the need to index the web and query the web and find things like we're all used to doing and take for granted today. And database technology didn't fit web data. It's much less structured. Um, you know, it doesn't like go into nice columns and rows of tables. The companies trying to do this had to do something. And so what Google did was they sort of bought themselves a farm of PhDs and laid a whole new foundation. They said, let's start over and do it all for clusters. And so let's build a file system that doesn't just have files on my local disk and my cell phone, but it can actually be one file spanning thousands of machines. Uh, and once you start spanning thousands of machines with thousands of disks, you're going to have failures. Uh, and so let's also replicate our data for fault tolerance and so that it will still be there and be highly available when we come back. So they kind of laid that foundation. And so, you know, you think maybe problem solved, they can store it. Well, now the question is, like, how do you analyze data that's on a thousand machines? How do I write a program as a human being that can do the analysis needed to index this and sort of see what the recommendations ought to be for uh, you know, sort of which, which links you ought to follow and so on? Uh, and so they came up with a model but have stole it from functional programming called the MapReduce programming model. And the idea is, you know, we can think about how to write parallel programs, we can write processes that communicate back and forth, but it's pretty difficult to write those programs. They said, let's just think about one piece of data at a time, or one little clump of data at a time, and then have an infrastructure that will apply that thinking in parallel to all your data. Um, so they came up with a model where what you do is you write what's called a map function that takes one piece of data and computes something. And one of the things it computes is a key value. And then we'll exchange the information sort of from the map function to the next function called the reduce function, which gets all the values basically with the same key. Everything that shares a common key, it gets to look at all of them. And you can try to solve problems by doing a map to compute something, or reduce to combine these things. Uh, and then their framework basically will take and do that to all your data, sort of all in parallel, all at once. And so you can kind of think about this as being sort of parallel programming for dummies, where the runtime does the heavy lifting, and you just have to think about one piece of data or one group of data. So this really opened up things for sort of people with more normal minds to write very parallelizable programs, because the framework applies your little thinking to big data. Okay, so just so that you have something to talk about at the party later tonight, 
Um, I want sort of everyone to understand MapReduce because you'll obviously people will be talking about MapReduce. This is kind of the core of big data from the systems world. And so the idea is you've got a whole bunch of computers. The whole bunch here is just two, but usually it's you know 200 or 2,000. Each one of them has data. So the one on the left has a document that says Romeo, Romeo, we're far out the Romeo. The other one has another document. And the goal is I'd like to know like how many times does each word occur across all of my document collections. This is kind of the classic example used to illustrate MapReduce. And so the idea is the mapper looks at one document, and there could be many on each computer as well, and just basically sees each word and emits that word in a one. And the word is the key. And then what happens after that's been done, the mapper outputs the words that it's encountered locally. This gets shuffled, and the word is used to route that to some next phase, which is the reduce phase. And so on the left, we see that the, that processor gets art, and that occurred twice, or once. And what it does is it takes that key value and counts things up and can produce the result. And so you can basically analyze a large C of documents by having each document be looked at. Do this, exchange this information, map by keys, and somewhere a given word will appear if its count can be added up. And so you can do something like a word count, you know, which is similar to what you end up doing when you build a of indexes, um, in parallel against sort of an arbitrary amount of data. I don't have to think parallel. I don't have to write programs that communicate messages. I just write map and reduce, and the framework takes care of it. So that's kind of the idea. So there's these two moves in this game. There's a map move and a reduce move. And partition parallelism makes this a parallel game. OK, so pretty soon everybody wanted this because Google said it was cool, and it actually seemed to work pretty well. And so Google's paper on MapReduce was used by the open source community, by Yahoo, Facebook, and others, to build what's called Hadoop, uh, which they'll also be talking about at your parties probably, um, which is the platform that supports MapReduce. And so the work on the Google file system led to the equivalent open source file system called HDFS. Um, the work on MapReduce led to the Hadoop MapReduce uh, framework. And this is really in very wide use today. It's, it's a hugely you know, sort of big business right now. Everybody is trying to use this to solve their big data problems uh, off in industry. But pretty quickly, if you try to use this, you, know, you get tired of MapReduce or MapReduce, MapReduce, uh, trying to solve this puzzle with just two moves. And so what people realized was that higher level languages that look surprisingly like data languages, databases could be useful here. And so there have been some of those developed, and they're now mostly used instead of MapReduce. And so there's a language called Pig from Yahoo, another one called Hive from Facebook, which is basically SQL for big data, uh, and some others that have been developed. And Microsoft sort of went through a similar set of things to the, the Google and open source community. Um, and then also, kind of on the flip side, related to uh, online transactions, there's a need to support sort of lots of simple operations on large amounts of simple data, like your user profile, um, at Facebook, you know, they have billions of these things and people are interacting with those profiles all the time. So there's another kind of big data system called the key value store or document store. It pretty much just supports put and get operations, but for very, very large amounts of data with high availability and high performance. Um, and there's a bunch of sort of what are called these NoSQL systems because they're much lower function and don't do queries. Google invented something called Bigtable and that became open source clone uh, into HBase. And pretty much for everything that Google did, there's an open source clone as well. Okay, so if you look at the architectures, there's a big difference between these systems. The, the database platform, while it's very good at processing large amounts of information, is a very closed platform. Basically, we'll take your data, we'll solve your problem, as long as you're willing to talk to us in SQL and come to us through this high-level language that we provide. We can parallelize that language and analyze your data just the way you want, but that's the only way you can use this platform. Your data has to fit in rows and columns and you have to speak SQL. If you look at the open source side, the sort of the big data world that we just talked about a second, um, it's a much more kind of open and free platform. The bottom is a file system. You can just use that if you want to store data. Uh, you can pick up a key value store on top of that if you want to put and get some records. Um, if you want to do sort of analytics and you can map your problem into map reduce steps and like the program, you can do that. Or if you'd like to have a higher level language, there's a layer that will translate from these higher level languages into map reduce programs and run them. So you have sort of much, a, a much more a messier diagram and a much more open diagram. And then the other thing you see if you go talk to any of the companies that are doing big data things, at least in kind of the web world, so maybe they'll look at Netflix or 
Amazon or other companies like that, what you'll end up is you'll see that they've got a whole bunch of these different systems sort of bubble gummed and bailing wire together in order to solve a problem today. And so it's a little less of a clean world than the previous database world because um, each system is very specialized and you have to couple them. Some other platforms, just to make you aware, there's a, a trend to do uh, big graph analytics, so big social graphs or big uh, you know, genomic graphs and things. There's some platforms that allow you to think like one node in a graph. Your node sort of gets some messages, makes a decision about what its local value is, and sends some messages. Again, the idea being, think about one thing, have a platform that applies that to many things. Uh, and then there's a new thing called Spark, which is starting to uh, become popular uh, for doing large repetitive kinds of iterative kinds of computations uh, on big level. But that's a quick review of the platforms. But you shouldn't use any of those platforms. <laughs> those are all yesterday's platforms. Uh, so what we set out to do, we sort of looked at this and went, you know, bubble gum and bailing wire is kind of messy, um, and we would really like to have a system that can do more of this in one system. Uh, it takes ideas from the database world, the parallel database world, from the big data or data intensive computing world, and deals with kind of the less structured, more semi-structured kind of data in a graceful way. Uh, so we came up with a list of things we would like such a system to have. It should have a very flexible model for data so that if you have you know, objects with other objects inside, you can say that rather than having to normalize everything in the tables. Um, if you don't know your types up front, you should be able to not be required to know them. It um, should have an efficient runtime. It should have a full query language, unlike the key value stores. Uh, and it should do things that are small tasks quickly, but large tasks can take time. Pretty much right now, you either can only do little things or you have to do very expensive things with existing platforms. Um, data is going to be coming in continuously, so we should help with that. And there's a lot of data types, text, and space, and time, where it would be nice for the system to understand them better and help you to query. So we kind of made that wish list. Uh, we, built a, we built a system. I'm just going to show you kind of two slides. If you're used to using databases, it kind of looks like a database. Um, and so this will relate to the advertisement I'll give you in a second. Um, but we sort of, we built this thing. Um, some highlights that I won't walk you through again. I just want this slide to be here for when you come back later uh, and decide you want to use this system. Um, inside, it runs on a big cluster of computers. And so it looks very much like a parallel database, but sort of generalized. Um, and so each of, those, you know, each of those manages storage and it gets involved in query processing. Your data is partitioned across the system. You can load data in or set up what are called continuous data feeds. You can ask queries, get your results back, uh, and so on. And we have a more open software stack. Again, I won't walk you through a lot of this. But the main thing is that the system we built called Asterix DB you know, is a complete system that's available. And we also have some open source software that I'll try to sell you for the same price, which is free, um, that does graph analytics, but it scales better than the, sort of the existing. Uh, so just to wrap up, so what's the sort of status of this work? Um, hopefully, mostly what you got out of this is a sense of what the platforms are that you might sort of hear about at parties. But um, we spent basically four years of NSF money working with San Diego and UC Riverside. Uh, and with Riverside, uh, that campus and I sort of co-developed and can hear um, the, the system, which I've mentioned. Um, we have some new efforts. One is to harden and share this with the community so that you can actually use it to solve it your problems and not just problems that we thought you might have. Um, and then we're also sort of doing some sort of next technology uh, ideas as well. The system has quite a few features, and so it has a full data model. You can do queries, inserts, deletes, manages your data for you, um, has a rich set of data types, and, and sort of a bunch of cool features, including things that allow you to do some spatial and temporal kinds of analyses. Uh, and if you have problems, if you've got data, you're trying to do maybe social data analytics, we've worked with one group uh, a couple times we've been doing things. If you want to analyze some education data, and it's a MOOC, so you have a big data problem there. Public health, maybe you're trying to do something around emergency response, looking at tweets, traffic, and other things. Um, this is a system that you can think about using as a place to put your stuff, and then a language you can use as a place to look at your stuff and start slicing and dicing the data. Um, so this is available. I'd be happy to talk to you sort of after the fact about that, um, if you'd like. Uh, if you want more information, uh, we have a sort of a project page that's listed there. Uh, if you Google Asterix DB, somehow it comes out as a top hit. You know, it's the most popular Asterix DB that there is in the world. Uh, and so you'll find it by just using that one keyword. If you're interested in large graph analytics, uh, and you can remember Pregolix, um, Google for that, and you'll find an open source thing that's equivalent to Google's Pregolix, our sort of open source clone of that. Um, and this is all sort of open source. It's been sponsored by a number of 
or helped by a number of companies um, and is freely available. Uh, so we encourage people to get involved with us if you want. We'd like to help you solve your problems and at the same time learn how our system can help solve problems better. Thanks, Mike. Uh, time for one quick question before we go to the last speaker in the first session. So we've, yeah, we've actually, the, sort of on the area of analytics, that's something we're starting to explore. We basically have what SQL has, roughly speaking, in terms of the kinds of analyses you can do. So you can sort of slice and dice your data in various ways, but the things you can aggregate, the kinds of computations you can do are sort of the usual uh, database language things, min, max, sum, count, average. We're looking at extending that set, and we actually have a student right now at UC Riverside who's sort of trying to build out the kinds of analyses you can do. Uh, but that's just one area that we're, not done a lot of function in yet, and we'd actually would be very interested in working with groups that have needs to understand how to prioritize which kinds of computations should go in next. All right.